Hey everyone, it's your host Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And today you all are in for a very special treat. This man, and I know I, I really work hard to find you guys quality interviews. And I am going to give myself a pat on the back right here because I have found a true diamond in the rough. You won't want to miss one second of what this man has to say. He is a heart. He has a heart of gold. And you will find out here shortly in this exciting episode. Stay tuned. Stay with us. Here we go. Hey everyone, it's your host Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And today we have Mr. Tom Bojo coming to the Gentleman Style Podcast stage. And he is a inspirational thought leader, provoking entrepreneur, so social justice advocate, spiritual growth, religious, spiritually well-placed entrepreneur. And he is actually, un- first of his kind, an unpaid CEO. He is the direct CEO for a one point billion dollar company and reimagining the workplace. He's been helping people venture into the business space and even wrote the book to help you, me, us, we. And and now his latest, greatest creation called the Homeboy Way. This man is helping um, inmates and people coming out of incarceration find their way back into society and helping them he's the ceo of homeboy industries the world's largest and most successful gang intervention rehabilitation and re-entry program and he was virtually invited encouraged and and invited by the father himself the man the myth the legend father greg Boyle, into this industry and now he's here on the gentleman style podcast stage helping us figure out how to do business better so i can't hold this man back without any further ado help me welcome to the stage mr thomas welcome welcome to gentleman style podcast show sir how are you doing great mark because that was a phenomenal introduction so appreciate that I appreciate you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Vojo, for making time for us on the Gentleman Style Podcast show today. You are the first of your kind, unpaid CEO. Now, I have my own thoughts on what that means, but tell can you tell the audience what that means for you and, and, and does it mean what it, it sounds like? Well, it, yes. Uh, thank you, Marcus. And please call me Tom. Um, it, what it means for me is, uh, look, I'm the CEO of Homeboy Industries, as you said in your introduction. Homeboys is a nonprofit. A, we're a gang intervention program. We help people leave gang life behind. And uh, and so I'm so blessed to have this second chapter in my career. Because in the my first chapter in my career, uh, you know, I ran a $1.8 billion set of businesses in the for-profit world. Uh, and I was fortunate, you know, because we in our, in our business, we were a private company and a public company and a private company. And if you can uh, be there through enough of those transactions, that's how you actually accumulate wealth and, and do well. And so my wife and I are, are, are blessed and fortunate. And so that then as I started my uh, my work with Homeboy, I started as a volunteer. And uh, Father Greg, a couple of months into my volunteer effort, asked me to come on as CEO. Um, you know, I, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to be in his orbit. And so I, I said, yes, and we can talk more about how that happened in a minute. Uh, but essentially, I came in and and I had all the thought process of American style business or capitalist business. So, okay, I would come in and while I didn't need the money, I would get paid. But within the first month of being at Homeboy, I realized Homeboy was running out of money. Mm. And uh, if I if I was taking money for my salary, then we weren't helping as many people. So I just feel so fortunate I've been able to come in as and be a volunteer. So quickly on, I, I stopped taking the salary. And and now over these past 12 years, it just, it just has felt good for a for me not only to give back, but I've received so much along the way. And so, yes, indeed, uh, I'm, a, I'm a volunteer, uh, and and I'm just I just feel fortunate I've been able to do it that way. So, 
So this this is your interview, but I need to. I feel like I can't ask the next question without giving some background on who Father Greg Boyle is. Father Greg Boyle is also known as Father Greg. He's an American Jusiate priest and the founder of Homeboy Industries, the world's largest gang intervention, rehabilitation, and reentry program. Father Greg served as a pastor of Dolores Mission Church in Boyle Heights in Los Angeles, California, a period marked by intense gang violence. In response to the needs of his community, he established Homeboy Industries in 1988, starting with a bakery that provided jobs and training to former gang members. And so my next question to you is, how did that interaction come between you and father when he introduced you and then you started volunteering for the program? How did that come about? What was what was it that sparked that conversation? Yeah. And so um, <clears throat> and so what in my corporate job, you know, we were always encouraged to sort of be local. And so for many years, I was on the board of the Salvation Army of Los Angeles and uh, a fellow board member there uh, was also a board member of Homeboy. And so when he heard I left the, the corporate world behind and retired out of that that phase of my life, uh, he asked me for uh, to, for lunch at the Homegirl Cafe. So let's back up for a second. Homeboy Industries, we're, uh, we're based in downtown Los Angeles. We help people leave a gang life behind, particularly as they're first getting out of prison or jail. And they don't want to go back on the streets in that survival mode. They want something different in their life. And so they, they come to Homeboy and we help them. Uh, and part of what we do is we have... We help them via our businesses because they can heal through the, having having purposeful activity, and that's what our jobs are about. So Homegirl Cafe is right here in downtown Los Angeles, and so my friend invited me uh, to the Homegirl Cafe, and I, I still remember this. It was 12 years ago. I still remember this like it was yesterday. I was having lunch with my friend and at the cafe, and I'm looking around, and I'm seeing this workforce it is a pretty good workforce, that they're, they're working hard, they're interacting with the customer, or they're they're taking you know direction from the supervisor, and in my for-profit life, I look. I made forty acquisitions and about well, forty companies. Sold five in my last eight years in the for-profit life. So you get a feel for good workforces and co companies that have shared values. And so as I'm sitting there having lunch with my friend, I'm realizing it's challenging my thought as a business guy that uh, that I realized right then and there that in my for-profit world, I would have never hired any one of those folks in that cafe because they had tattoos on their face, because they had felonies and they were gang members. And yet in the context of a job, they're changing the life around. And so for me who believes in businesses, it really challenged my own thinking. And, and I started thinking more about, well, maybe I should get involved and see what's, what is happening here at Homeboy and, and learn by it. So I started as a volunteer. I wanted to figure out if my business skills could be used in a different way. And I, I, so I, so I joined on. And then a couple months into that interaction, um, Homeboy was going through a financial uh, tough time, a crunch crisis, really. And uh, and in those two months, I had a chance to sit with Father Greg and listen to how he thought about the world and how we thought about people. And I was almost mesmerized that here is a, a frankly, a living saint, and here's he helping the most demonized and forgotten people in our society, and it's working. And so uh, when Greg asked me to come on board to, to take over for him, not take over, but really lead the organization while he does more what he's really good at, uh, again, I couldn't pass up that opportunity. But it challenged my notion that what a business guy thought about the working poor in our society and, and people who have been incarcerated. And so uh, it's been a great partnership for the past 12 years. Um, he's allowed me to, to run the organization. We've now grown from $10 million to $50 million. Of, of, of revenue and spend along the way, which means we're able to help five times as many people. Uh, but we've stayed true to Greg's vision of kinship and compassion. And so uh, I've learned so much over these these 12 years. And uh, I've been, been blessed to be part of the organization where people work to change their lives. I told y'all, I told y'all, a true heart of gold. Tom, T tell me, what is it, the stigma that corporate America has with high? I, is it just the tattoos? Is it just the gang affiliations, the felony records? What is the problem in corporate America with hiring felons? What's the biggest hurdle that these these men and women have to overcome, and why in twenty twenty four is it still a problem? Well, yeah, no, that's an excellent question. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. 
And let me give you the answer. I want to put the context in front of you first. Please. So I view myself as a pretty typical guy in corporate America, right? You know, so first generation college graduate, joined a business, worked hard, worked my way up to the top, all that. And but like like we get in our silos in, in, in mainstream America where it's like you just you think you know what's going on, but you never get outside and, and get in relation with people on the margins. So I came into homeboy like probably the way most people think about it. That people join gang life because they because they've chosen that, that that people do crimes because they've chosen that, that people will always keep on doing crimes because that's what their life's about. All that could be furthest from the truth. And so because people have these perceptions, that's why they don't get hired in corporate America. I learned early on my homeboy, um, you know, I remember sitting there once sitting with Father Greg and uh, somehow we got into a discussion of, of this young man we were just talking about in his office. And, uh, and again, like he said something that struck me that people join gangs because uh, not because they want to, but because that's the only choice they've had. They're second, third generation gang members. They think that's their family. So most of these folks are preordained just to be in, in, in gang life. And they do violent crime and crime because they are hopeless. They don't see a hope out there. And so the interesting thing is like this concept of longer sentencing and, and, and longer prison um, terms. It's just nutty because none of these folks think they're going to live past 25. And so if you have, if your perspective is there's no future for you, there's no hope, you're going to go off and do some really, really bad stuff. And so it's like not understanding what what really drives sort of people to, to be in gangs and then not really understanding corporate America doesn't understand and when they come out of jail, they don't want to do that anymore. They want a normal life, a mainstream life, a, a, a life with a job with dignity of labor. And so uh, corporate America is afraid of their felonies, afraid of all that happening. And yet what they don't realize when I see every day, listen, we, Homeboy Andrews, we have 8,000 people walk through our doors every every year, right? I see folks every day and our folks come out. They don't have a lot of confidence in themselves. They don't, they know they don't fit in society. They don't know how to make it happen. And so what I'm out here trying to do even with this book and, and why I wrote the book is to show that, well, wait a minute, if we actually treat people with kinship and respect and give them a second chance and lean into when uh, they, they do have a problem, we help them through their challenges. They are become loyal and good workers and they does they will do a good job for you. And so it's this is misaligning of understanding of what's happening to someone who leaves the prison system to what a corporation wants. Huge. Huge. Sir, what is some, what, there's gotta be a, a secret sauce. And can, can you just share one secret sauce? Yeah. What, is, what is a secret that, or something that you can share um, that we can do as business owners, as corporate America can do to change that mindset around hiring felons? Because it, it, do you have like a lengthy interview process? What, what's the what's the thought? Is it paying them well? Hey, just pay. I've, I've seen that flash so many times. If you pay people right, they're less likely to go back to crime. What's the sauce do you think can I can change my mind and change corporate America's mind on hiring felons like, hey, man, like, like it to me, it doesn't make sense to not hire someone just because they have a record. If the job that they're, especially if the duties that they're doing doesn't handle cash. If you're a convicted felon and it dealt with money, just don't put you around the register, right? I can still hire you. I just can't put you around money, but I can still employ you. What's the sauce there? Is there any nuggets yeah. you can share for corporate? Yeah, America? sure, sure. And this one's not going to be a short answer. This will because it's a complicated it. question, right? It's complicated. Yes, sir. Um, listen. So well, let me first say I know you asked the question differently. The secret sauce for homeboy is uh, it really is when someone walks through our doors, we don't judge them for their again their tattoo or their felony or their gang membership. We lean in and help them in a positive way that they've never had a chance to do this job. Uh, and so what Homeboys is about, while I'm talking about jobs and our businesses, it's about helping people heal from their complex trauma. Mm -hmm. Nearly all our folks are victims of complex trauma from a young age. They got jumped into a gang. Their their mother was addicted to drugs or they were told to stand on the corner for the, to be the lookout. They were told they're no good. 
don't drop out, they like told them to drop out of school. All those things create trauma, right? And so what Homeboys is about is helping people heal from their trauma. And we have sort of have this way, of, particularly Father Greg has this way of kind of expressing this, that, and this is what's nutty about our prison system in our society, to think that you can release tens of thousands of prisoners a year, and just because some government program helps them write a resume, it's going to allow them to be to be stable enough to work. It's kind of nutty. It's, it's just so hard. But so the, we have this way of saying it that like like you can education is important. You know, if you come out of prison, but you get an education, that's not going to stop you from doing more crime, right? If you if you come out of prison, and get a job, that's not going to stop you from getting more doing more crime. If you come out and heal from your trauma and recognize the trauma you've experienced, the trauma you've perpetrated, and you heal and you build a resiliency, you're not going to go back into crime. And so the, really the insight is healing, caring. And so Homeboy does that full on with a lot of resources. Everyday businesses can do that just by giving someone the space, knowing that they have challenges. Let, let me give you an example. At Homeboy, we try to put all, all the jobs we takes to run the organization, we try to have our population, our clients, homies do those jobs. As an example, my executive assistant, I've had five of them now, they, we, we teach them the job as they're healing, and they go out and get executive assistant jobs elsewhere. Well, my executive assistant from a couple of years back, you know, very dedicated, single mother, been in and out of youth camp, youth jail, then went to adult jail, come, comes back out, lives in a shelter, with her young daughter, lives in a shelter with a young daughter, but she shows up work every day on time and does a good job. And through our therapists and other women around, good mentorship has, has helped her move her life forward. I still remember this one time as a nonprofit, as an organization, we have a board. And so we have quarterly board meetings that start at 7 a.m. And she would get there at 6.30, get the water there, the, all the paperwork in place, set up the room. I remember this one time, the day before one of our board meetings, she gets a call from her parole officer and saying that she needed to report into his office at 8 a.m. the next day. And when she said, well, no, I have responsibilities here. I have a board meeting i got to help out for. He said to her, if you don't show up at 8 a.m., I'm going to violate you, which means she'll go back into the prison system only because she didn't show up for that one meeting. And so, of course, we're homeboy. We said, yep. Yeah, Go take care of your business. Go to your parole, right? But think about it. If this was a situation that wasn't homeboy, if this was just any other business, you know, hopefully you would think that other businesses would give her that time off to go to her parole hearing. But would she have enough shame to say to not really even ask because she didn't want people to know that she had to still report in uh, along the way? And would other businesses kind of dock her pay and say, you know, you know, three more tardies and you're fired or you have, you have to take personal time. So I guess I say that story to say people who come out who have been incarcerated have a lot of challenges that society throws up against them. And that if you want to do it the right way, these people, they need time, they need resources to get through it. And if, and as you hire this population, you got to, we, I would want you to sort of give them more rope, give them more flexibility in their job. And I'm telling you, they'll be great workers, they'll be loyal workers, and you'll be really happy that you You've done that. So it's not just sort of like, unfortunately, simple, what's the secret sauce? It's I guess the secret sauce is caring and go out of your way to, to help people in their life with their life troubles as they're working for you. That's, that's, that's exactly what came to mind. Caring. Mm -hmm. You have to care about people. You got to care. That's right. right. This, you is homeboy has mastered you have mastered something that is new to 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 corporate america which is emotional intelligence you have to care about people not they're not a number they're not just a, a id number that that clocked in and clocks out every people have lives that that need living right and 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 yeah. sometimes stuff gets in the way yeah, well, let me challenge you a little bit. Like I, I agree, and I want to disagree, right? Okay. So, it is caring, and I think there are a lot of companies out there who care for their people, and I think great companies care for their people. Right? And to me, it's like I, I'm, a, I'm still, I do. While well, I'm a nonprofit leader, I go to all these conferences. I lead off by saying I'm, a, I'm a committed capitalist. I believe well-run companies are good for our society. 
And I think there are a lot of well-run companies out there who care for the people. And here's what I want to though say, oftentimes though, they care for the people who they're comfortable with, the people they're comfortable with, right? And that and this back to your other question about why don't they hire more felons? Because they're not comfortable with them. And so I think what we've learned at Homeboy is is to, is to move ourselves to be in relationship with people on the margins of our society. And once you start feeling comfortable with that and start caring for those folks, that's how you really make, make a difference. And so just not just don't care for someone who's like you. Care for someone who's not like you. Easy to say, hard to do. It is. You're so right. The, I, I, I've read a, on LinkedIn, I read a, a, a job post. is like people hire who they like. Mm-hmm. But you do you you push against the grain. You hire people that you may not like, who may not have experienced life the same way you have, who may not have the same upbringing, who may not have the, the same benefits that you did. Exactly. But they still deserve a chance. Absolutely. <sighs> mm-hmm. I, I wanna I wanna tap into your business skills because you have a vast year of, of knowledge of business. And so you walk, you came through the front door, you volunteered to get a feel for it, for the, the business for homeboy. And you saw that there was financial troubles. What happened? Um, what happened? And then second part, how did you turn it around? Mm. Yeah. So homeboy industries is a, a first and foremost, a human services organization. We, we help people. We help people who are disenfranchised, forgotten, unhoused, without clothing, without food. And, uh, and we're a nonprofit, which means um, two thirds of our revenue uh, comes from donations. And about a third comes from our social enterprises. Very little money comes from government. And so uh, we help as many people as possible. And so when I first came on, they were helping more people than we had money for. And you know, it's, it's, you can't blame them. And people come in and need, it's, it's funny. I've, I've come to think about this over the years um, you know, for many years, we're very financially solid now, but for the first five or six years, we were on the edge, hard to make payroll, always worried. We didn't have a, a financial reserve and we didn't have a rainy day fund. And you know, look, most well-run businesses have financial reserves and a rainy day fund. But I remember thinking about how Father Greg would think about it. You know, like why, what do you have a rainy day fund for emergencies? Why well, have a rainy day fund when it rains every day? If people coming through your, through your doors every day, need money for food, need money for rent, need money for um, 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 cars, to transportation, safe transportation. It's a struggle. And so what was happening is constantly running out of money. And so uh, what kind of changed that around was recognizing that, uh, you know, like, like it was any, I came in with business experience, but as any organization, it's like, what do you have? Does the team feel empowered to make the right decisions? Do they know, are we transparent? Do they know how much money we have, how to spend it, how to move it forward? And so um, really for me, it's running the nonprofit was different, but the same. It was trying to get the nonprofit leaders that were there, recognizing that you need to wear two hats. You need to wear the business hat. You need to wear the mission hat. You need to have not those in conflict, but those in unison as you're making decisions and just to be very careful about only spending the money that we have and to be able to say no. Because the hardest thing is to say no when people are in such need. And so that's it, it's not easy. The other factor that is more difficult at Homeboy than most other organizations is we have a high cost of failure. You know, if we know if we're not hiring that homie, he's back out on the streets running with the gang and probably doing something pretty violent. And so it works on the psyche here of how, to, how do we stretch every nickel as far as we can but you also have to sort of set boundaries that there's only so much you do for people. You can't want something more for somebody than they want for themselves. And so it's sort of understanding those lessons and then teaching the management team underneath how to kind of run the organization, how to be more responsible. That's that's powerful. Did when you when you got in and it wasn't profitable and you saw the trouble and you you sh- had to teach your leadership team how to stretch that penny. Um, did you did you have to infuse any cash into the business? Did you have to borrow any money, anything like that, to to help turn things around? Because now you you all have grown. The organizational social enterprise that you just mentioned spans multiple verticals: homegirl cafe, homeboy recycling, 
and your newest venture, Homeboy Threads and Homeboy Pet Spot. So what, did you have to do anything um, different um, from his predecessor, the father? Yeah, yeah. No, no. And by the way, Father Greg's still with us. He's just, he's, he's oh. our emotional leader, spiritual leader. Yes, sir. Um, and, um, but yeah, it's like, like when we, when I came in, I mean, this is the struggle a lot of nonprofit organizations run through. You get to a certain size and how do you get the finances in place and how do you kind of jump up a level, right? Uh, at the time, we, we, Homeboy didn't have a banking facility, so we had no way of borrowing money. Um, and so I was had an established relationship with the banks, uh, had to come up with a way of borrowing money against our assets along the way. And so we did put a loan in place. Uh, but the key was in our loan, we had to pay it off by the end of every year. So we had to work really hard on the understanding our cash flow and cash needs and, uh, and put those in place. And so over time, though, what's interesting is, uh, you know, we've grown from, again, $10 million to, to almost $50 million now. Um, but over the only last couple of years, have we have a financial reserve. So my point is the first six or seven years, we always are spending as much as we can. Uh, we're blessed with very generous donors, entrepreneurs who've made it themselves. And so they saw the value of us investing in our social enterprises to provide purposeful activity and provide a job for people. And what makes our social enterprises different is, is that we bake bread to hire homies, not hire homies to bake bread. So it is a little bit of a flip of a mindset that we're running our businesses so we can provide job opportunities for people, not running our businesses just to sort of deliver bread out there. And so um, it's finding donors and people who are willing to invest in those type of businesses so that we can keep growing those and providing more, more job opportunities. So, so I want to dig in there real quick. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying, because this goes against the grain of all businesses, mm -hmm. you are saying, hey, we need the bakery so we can hire more employees and help provide more assistance and help people versus traditional business is I need people so I can make more bread. Did I understand that? Correctly? Yeah, you got that exactly right. And and look, I recognize not everyone's going to think about it that way, but I think you can keep the, those two notions going together at the same time. You know, our social enterprise business weren't running that effectively when I first showed up, but now they do. I mean, they, they were as competitive as a for-profit business. The only difference is we carry more labor than a for-profit business, you know, two to three times as much labor because we want to create those jobs. So anything we would make in profits, we would pour back into extra labor and extra, extra people on staff. And so, um, and that's, that, that's our approach. And so as we open up these new businesses, like, like electronic recycling or apparel recycling or a dog salon, uh, we're going to open up with the for-profit mindset, but know that we're going to spend that profit line to hire more people. And provide more opportunities for folks. That's, that's a game changer. T tell me, y'all, what company works hard to make sure you have a place to work and 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 get services? What? Tell me what what company you've ever worked for. This is huge, sir. The think on Mr. Tom is absolutely mind blowing right now, and that's big. And I. I I, I I need more of you. <laughs> like if you could just clone yourself, sir, that is huge. Well, there's a lot of good things. You know, the other way, that Marks, if you, um, the other thing I think about this, like I take my for-profit experience of again buying 40 companies in eight years, right? And uh, and look, homeboys again blessed with a lot of donors, but they would say to me, Tom, you know, I'm willing to give donate homeboy every year, but if you ever run across a business opportunity, let me know, and I want to invest in it, right? And so finally. Uh, four years ago, we started our Homeboy Venture and Jobs Fund. And so I wanted to organize it like a for-profit venture fund. And so what do venture funds do? They take capital and they put it at risk. They take capital and you know, they'll acquire by 10 companies. And maybe one of those companies is successful, which is a home run. The other things don't, aren't successful. But they're willing to put capital at risk to make profit. And so what I'm trying to do in the venture fund is put capital at risk help society by creating quality jobs for people who wouldn't have jobs. And, and that's kind of a different view of how social impact investing should be and how we help people on the margins of our society. So I have a question that's a little bit self-serving. Yeah, um, sure. It's called a gentleman style podcast show. Um, God, family, finance, self. So I got to ask a question on spirituality. How does 
your spirituality influence your business leadership style? Because your leadership style has had the taste of both worlds now. Um, not to say that it was lacking in any particular area, but how does your leadership style and your spirituality come into play in business? Yeah, I appreciate the question. You know, um, again, I'll, one of these I'll give you a longer answer. <laughs> Uh, I was typical in corporate America. You know, tell, show me the rules, I'll follow the rules, and I'll do well. So, uh, you know, it's uh, and so in, in in the corporate world, it's it's really hard to talk about God and spirituality. It's just not really accepted, right? And so I show up a homeboy, and whereas I was a, I was sort of religious and a you know churchgoer, I wasn't deep in my spirituality. I show up a homeboy, and it just nicely hugs you or smacks you in the face or embraces you. Uh, listen, we're not a religious organization, but we're soaked in spirituality. And as I wa watch and I pay attention and I see what changes people's lives, it's really them really them um, being on their spiritual path. And so uh, this is so very clear to me is that our folks are victims of complex trauma, right? And they're in pain. And you can either transmit that pain or, or transform that pain. And they tr and they eventually transform that pain. And I'm so committed to seeing this now. They transform that pain when they first understand that they need to love themselves before they can love others. And they start loving themselves when they finally understand that God loves them no matter what. And so what we talk about home is God is too busy loving us to be judging us. And that gets the heart of the matter. And that's what allows transformation. And so then to your question, me as a business leader, how do I kind of internalize that? And, and I've been on this phenomenal, me, myself, phenomenal spiritual path these last 12 years. I say phenomenal because I never would have been on this if I didn't show up at Homeboy. And I've really come to understand how my faith, my spirituality has, I see that every day. And it, it shows up every day to your now to your question. It's, to me, I think it shows up every day is finding joy through others. You know, we, in my faith, you, 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 you can pray, you can believe, you can have this concept of God. But I think in my faith, God has also asked us to help my brother and my sister to put action in, not just not just pray, but to move to action. And at Homeboy, moving to action means being moving to the margins, being in relationship with those who are demonized. And relationship means not telling them what to do, but, but sharing, equally sharing. And so con concretely, to me, my faith shows up in that finding joy through people every day. And that's how I'm a different leader. I want to I I clone this gentleman and put him in a box and ship him to every major. I want to ship him to Apple, uh, Microsoft, Google, because they need this type of leadership style. This is huge. This is major. We have to pay homage to our sponsors. We have one quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Stay with us. We'll be right, right back. If you're looking for a reliable, professional trucking and logistics service, you've come to the right place. Musa Trucking is a veteran-owned and operated premier transportation provider that can help with all of your trucking and logistics needs. Musa is revolutionizing the trucking industry through strategic partnerships, the development of core personnel, and the use of cutting edge technology. Our inventory system ensures that cargo ends up divided into the right trucks and reaching the correct destination. Our drivers are dedicated to transporting goods efficiently and safely. Contact us today to get started by visiting the website on the screen or by calling 757-756-5246. I'm Marcus Norman, bringing fresh vibes to hot topics surrounding culture, relationships, business, finance, sex, dating, faith, and everything in between. Whether you're into passive income opportunities, trending topics and useful relationship tips, or dynamic guest speakers, there's something for everyone. You can expect all that and more every week. If you're down with this content, then consider joining our growing community by subscribing to Gentleman Style Podcast and smash the bell to get on our VIP list. Your support means the world. Thanks for watching.
link to my channel. We are back to the Gentleman Style Podcast Show, and we have Mr. Tom Vojo on the show here spilling the tea on home boy industries and he is spilling the tea on his thought process how he was joined volunteered for this organization and and now leading this organization as the unpaid ceo first of his kind i've never heard of this and it is truly phenomenal inspiration his work is a a, a testament to what I think more businesses, every businesses needs to incorporate, not next week, not next year, today. This is huge. If you missed anything, a part of what this man has laid down, the foundation this man has laid down, go back, scroll back, check him out. He's on where iHeartRadio, radio.com, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Facebook business page, anywhere you, and even on Audible, anywhere you get your podcast, Mr. Tom is there spilling the tea here on gentleman style podcast today this is huge mr tom sir um you there's i can imagine there's a huge demand of your time in every which direction right running this nonprofit and the ex- expansive portfolio you've built with homeboy sir how do you balance family business relationship with your wife and and kids and helping people at homeboy every day how do you juggle it all what's what's any secrets there um yeah i first got a a chuckling to myself that um i work it's funny thing i I work as hard as as i've ever worked uh think back my for-profit career you know 1.8 billion dollar set of companies public company private company had all those pressures you know 18,000 employees type of thing a lot of resources a lot of stress, but here at Homeboy, it's more stressful, more hours than ever before. And what my chuck is, my wife would say, I'm happier than I've ever been. Wow. And that comes from sort of finding joy through others and being part of this community of kinship and feeling like you're making a difference along the way. Um, now, it's not to say life is easy, but it is, my, my wife would say, I'm, I'm, I'm far happy. Look, I'm, my practice, I have meditation practice, um, it's through my spiritual journey, I, I wake up, I do my prayers, I do my meditation, do my contemplation, and sort of do reading. But it's also, it's this concept of, if, if every day I'm coming up, waking up, every trying to find joy and joy through others, you know, all, all those other stressors kind of like take, take a backseat. And so I, I feel so blessed to be part of the homeboy community and to have learned how to kind of balance all that. It's, I just can't express my thanks enough. Yes, sir. What 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 fills you up? What inspires you? Who inspires you? Who pours into you? Mm. You know, look, there's there's, there's hundreds and thousands of, of stories uh, that inspire me. I want to take two, if you allow me, to take two parts of that question. You know, I'm Please. I'm still yes. a competitive business guy, and so I want to win. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I try to suppress that sometimes. I need to suppress that. But you know, I see so much at home, boy. I see so much struggle. Uh, People have challenges who are poor in our society. And it makes me angry sometimes. It makes me angry to see like, oh my gosh, they don't have, you know, there's two Americas here. I write this in my book, The Homeboy Way. It's no great insight, I just put it on paper for myself. There's the America, the rest of us who, who I've come from, and there's America, the, of the people we serve, the working poor, the business and franchise. Healthcare is different, right? Getting dental care is different. Trying to get a bank account is different. Trying to rent an apartment is different, right? Just sort of people looking at you is different, right? And so it is just so hard. And I think about this and I think what Homeboy does is we deal with serious violent offenders. They come out, they want, don't want to go back into gang life. And so we help them. And we have a very good success rate. And a number of years ago, there was a study. It turns out, you know, 70% of people come to the Homeboy program never go back into the jail system. That's 30% recidivism. That compares to a statewide average of 70% recidivism. We're two times better than the statewide average. So Homeboy is a way of not helping people only leave gang life and prison behind, but helps them get jobs and quality jobs, lift them out from poverty. And so if Homeboy can lift people out from poverty, other folks can do this. This is my angry part, my competitive part. Poverty rate in America has been the same for 45 years, the same narrow band, 12 to 13%. 
we haven't figured this out. And yet I see Homeboy is able to, through kinship, love, and compassion and resources, help lift people out of poverty. And so I say to, this is my challenge to the, the corporate world out there, listen, they, look, the next 15% of all your hires over the next year, hire the working poor and give them resources. And that's how we can improve society by lifting people, up, people out of poverty. And so what, is, what keeps me going is this fire of trying to show that to others that you can do this, you can do the same thing. Then, of course, the inspiration every day is to see how every day our folks live unbelievable, traumatic lives, such pain, and that they're authentic, they have joy, they have tears, and they share that with me. And that's what's so special. Sir, if you'll allow me, I, I can't let you go without talking about the book, The Homeboy Way, a radical approach to business and life on Amazon available today. Sir, how how long did it take you to write this? And why did you write this book? Yeah, you know, when I first showed up at Homeboy, um, so many things were different compared to my for-profit world. I thought to myself, wow, there's a lot of nuggets I'm learning from being around these gang members, these gang leaders, and a fairly Jesuit priests, Father Greg. And so I, you know, over the years, I thought about maybe I should write a business book and then I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And so I first sat down to say, I'm going to write a book that if, if I was ever to go back into the for-profit world, what lessons would I bring back? And so then as I started writing it against that, I also sort of sort of then started talking about homeboy and the, people are, the struggles of people who are poor in our society, you know, how to lead a business with, with diversity. You know, as an example, you know, two thirds of our management team are former clients. So we've worked really hard to kind of raise folks up from within. The business world needs to learn how to, how to do all that. And I also started talking about, which is not comfortable for me, my own faith journey in that, look, if, me, if this typical middle class kid from New Jersey can figure out how to get on a faith journey, a lot of other folks can as well. It's just kind of being nudged in the right way. And that's why I wrote the book, is, that, is to share what happens at Homeboy and that hopefully people will learn something by it and uh, take that same journey themselves. What's your plan for the future of Homeboy? You, you, you look great. You're young. You're, what is the plan for the future for Homeboy? Yeah, well, we, we, Father Greg and I both say it this way. For Homeboys to be running Homeboy. Right for the men and women who are former gang members who've come through this program, changed their life around. You know, we worked hard to raise them up through all levels of management that they would be running it. You know, um, there's still so many people in LA County who want to leave gang life behind. We turn so many folks away each each week. 15 people interview become part of our organization. We only can take two, and we take the two that need us the most uh, along the way. And so the future is to have it thrive going forward, is get the financial resources in place, but also get the people in place, the management in place. And that's really where my efforts been in these last few years of mentoring next generation of leaders. If you could wave a magic wand and fix one thing that would make the biggest impact to homeboy, what would it be? <laughs> 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 There's nope. so many things I want to say. You know, um, I'm going to take the liberty and give you two things. <laughs> the One of the messages I want to get across, and, and a lot of folks understand this, but I want to reinforce it. You know, there's this cliche out there that money doesn't solve problems. But I want to say for people who are poor in our society, money does solve problems. They have so many challenges just leaving gang life, like just trying to get their raise their family. And then they get hit by medical bills or economic disaster happens. Money solves problems. There's not enough money for the poor in our society. So one big one would be, let's get them the resources. And then they can fo focus on the others. And then the other magic one is, um, you know, let's just be in kinship. I know it sounds cliche, but uh, being kinship people unlike ourselves really will help improve society. I told y'all, I told y'all, a true heart of gold. This has been an 
epic interview. One of my favorites. This this is oh my gosh. Sir, how can how you've dropped so many nuggets this episode? What's the one thing? One more nugget if you had it in your hat. One more nugget you could share to that young boy, that young girl, they just got out and they're they're trying to figure out life. What would that one more nugget in your hat be to them? Any bits of advice to them? Yeah, now I'm going to um, try to paraphrase Father Greg phrase, right? You know, uh, we think about God and the God we want, the God we seek, the God we see is a God who can't take his eyes off of you or us. So the nugget is you are loved, you are cherished, you are seen. How can we connect with you? How can we connect with Homeboy? What, what my audience, how can our listeners learn more about Homeboy Industries and get involved? Get involved today. How can they yeah. do that? Uh, come to our uh, website, homeboyindustries.org, our webpage. We have a lot of great content on our Facebook page. Was, every day we do thought of the day affirmations and our, each of our clients do that. It's, it's really terrific. It's a terrific community of kind of sharing and learning along the way. And of course, buy the book. You learn more about it. Homeboy buy the book. Buy the book. Buy the book. Connect, connect, connect. Let's bring that back up on the screen. Connect, connect, connect. That is huge, 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 huge. Homeboy Industries, y'all. Get connected. Get involved and change the world. Sir, I want to say this to you publicly. Don't ever quit. <laughs> we need you. I yeah. know it's hard. I know it's hard. <laughs> and I know I'm. you're there... human. You have your days. But don't ever quit. We need thank, you. Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you all for tuning in to the Gentleman Style Podcast show. I hope this message is inspiring. I hope this is encouraging. I hope this, this, I had to fight back tears a little second ago when he mentioned about incarceration. I've never dealt with incarceration, but this is a need. And he's, he's the, I want to say he's one of the first, not the first, but he's one of a kind. The, the Father Greg, Mr. Thomas, they are rare, but they're so, so necessary. And there should be more of them. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope this helps you. I hope this helps you take your, your mindset, your business to the next level. Like we end every show, take care of your friends, take care of your family, and always, always take care of business. Love you guys. Bye.